I'm going to talk this morning just for a few minutes. How much time I got? I got a few minutes. I'm going to talk about the consistency to, the, to your next level. I should have made it personal. Consistency to your next contingency. Consistency. That's a part of it. That's a part of it. I'll get to that consistency in a minute. But contingencies to your next level. I need you to understand something very, very important for us, and this is for all of us, that where, where you're going in your life and in the kingdom of God, you're going to have to understand the contingencies that are connected to it. You ready for it? Okay. I'm, normally, I would ask you to stand for the reading of the scripture, but because of my time, I want to just kind of share the story with you and uh, hope that you will go home and read the whole story. If I had time, I would take you to Genesis chapter number four, and I would have you read verses one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, and probably ten. So you got to read it when you get home. Therein lies this particular story. Some of you already know the story because you learned this in Sunday school. It's the story of Cain and Abel. The story of Adam and Eve coming together, making some children, the first child they have. They have these children, the children by the name of Cain and the other child is named Abel. And some of you know the story. Well, the Bible says that, that Abel brought a gift to God, a sacrifice, and so did his brother Cain. They brought gifts. Abel, uh, he was... The, the one who took care of the, the, the flock. And uh, Cain was the guy who kind of took care of the, the soil. So, so Abel was the guy who uh, gave God gifts from his, his stock. His, his, the Bible says he gave God the fat portion of what he had as a sacrifice, as a gift to God. And it was uh, Cain who worked the soil and he gave God a gift from the soil. Some of you know the, the end of the story that the Lord said to Cain um, some interesting things. And he had to speak to Cain in a specific way because the Bible, the story says that God showed favor to Abel's sacrifice more than he showed favor to Cain's sacrifice. And while they're both in the same place where, where God has to have this this conversation with them and to respond to their sacrifice and their gifts. Unfortunately, Cain, after hearing that God showed more favor to his brother's gift than he showed in favor to his gift, he got upset. Y'all know the story. He got so upset, and this is important for you to, to get this. You got to read it when you get home. He got so upset that he set out to kill his brother. He calls his brother into the field with him and he kills him. The word, well, not the word, but the Bible says in that fourth chapter of Genesis that the blood of his brother began to scream out and God heard the cry of his brother's blood. And he calls, he calls Cain, he calls Cain in and he asks Cain the question, why why are you acting like this and why do you look like this? Because the Bible says that Cain's face was downtrodden. It was, it was looking really weary and, and worn. It was messed up. And God sees this and he asks him, why are you in this condition? Why do you look like this? And then he says something that was so very powerful in that seventh verse. And I'll read that seventh verse for you. He says in that seventh verse, he says these words, if you do what is right, mm, and he's speaking to Cain, who just killed his brother. He said, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. This is so powerful. But then he says to Cain, he said, but you must master it. I'm so challenged by this, and I'm going to take you through some moments um, for your understanding of the contingencies that are necessary for you to get what you believe you should receive from God. Because Cain believed that he should have received from God a more favorable response, but he didn't get it. If you go over to Hebrews chapter 11, you'll read about the faith of Cain and, and Abel, and, and, they, and it kind of gives us the understanding that it was by faith that Abel offered up his sacrifice. And it was by just his natural ability to give God a sacrifice that Cain gave of his sacrifice. But what God did was God noticed something very special about Abel's sacrifice because his sacrifice came from a place of faith. 
Now I need you to walk with me just for a second. I'm going to put it all together. His sacrifice came from a place of faith. God always, well, I think he does. He always examines us and what we give to him, not just based on what we give him, but I think he examines us from the conditions of our heart that caused us to give. You've heard it. Man looks on the outward appearance, but yeah, I believe that everything that we do, God searches the heart in our doing. So that, so that, so that, I don't know if it's for our benefit, but it's so that he will understand how much more he can trust you with. You didn't get that. God has to always check the condition of your heart. Also, the other thing that he has to always check is the condition of your attitude. How did, what kind of attitude, you, what kind of attitude did you have when you gave? Because God will judge not just your giving, because there, there, there's, a, there's a, a scripture in the Bible where he says, I'm weary of your sacrifice. I'm sick and tired of your sacrifice. I'm tired of you giving me a sacrifice that it has no meaning connected to it. I ain't never read that. Read your Bible. He says, why do you give me this meaningless sacrifice? You, you got to put some real serious contents in your giving. You got to make sure that you're giving from the right place in your mind. In your heart. So God will judge us based on the condition of our attitude, the condition of our minds, what we got going on the inside of us. Because there comes a time when God will bless you, not for the sake of you whoring up the blessing for yourself. But if you don't have it in your right mind, why I'm getting blessed like this? He says, he says, I want your, your covers to overflow. He says, I want to give you so much abundance. And the reason why I want you to have this abundance is not for you to hoard up for yourself. But if your mind is conditioned that whatever I get from God is just for me. We condition ourselves in that respect. But God's trying to get us to go beyond ourselves and to see much more in his giving to you. So in order for us to understand his giving to us, we got to embrace the contingencies that are being made available to us. You're not, okay. Some of you, you probably should have left. I don't know if somebody's watching by streaming. It's too late. Some of you have come to the place in this next level in your relationship with God that you can no longer give God what God does not accept. Let me qualify what I'm saying. Most of us in here think that whatever we give God, he's got to accept it. I'm going I'm to take you to a new level now in your relationship with the Lord and tell you that there has to be some contingencies connected to God responding to whatever you do. And he shows us that. He shows us that in a natural way. He shows us that in a physical way. He shows us that in a spiritual way. Let me, let me kind of share that with you just, just, for, just for a few more minutes. I, I know I only have but a few more minutes left and I'm going to take real good time to share with you. In the natural, you see... Almost, er well, almost everything. Pretty much, I don't know, I'm a little scared right now. Now, I must just get out there. Everything in life, whether it's natural, whether it's physical, or even spiritual, has contingencies connected to it. If you go up on a building and jump off, you're going to fall. In the natural, there can never be a sunrise without a darkness. Contingency. Can't have the light except there was the darkness. That's in the natural. In the natural, there'll be no growth without rain. Natural. Natural. Plant a seed, you don't water it, don't give some water to it, it's not going to grow. That's the contingency. That's the contingent. It's contingent upon the growth. It's contingent upon the rain. Are you with me? There'll be no rainbow with, without the storm. The rainbow is contingent upon the storm. The storm has to come for the rainbow to follow. That's just how the laws of contingencies work. You, you can't have a harvest. Uh-oh. This is the part that you're going to really fight with me in. You cannot have a harvest without planting a seed. Let me camp out there just for a second. Years ago when I was coming up in the church, 
You know, they used to say, that's kind of you, remember, we up, come up in the church. They used to say, if you don't have no seed, you don't have no, well, they didn't say seed. Back in the day, they just said, if you don't have no offering. If you don't have no offering, give me a, back, a bucket. Give me a bucket. Hurry. They used to say, and they used to say, well, um, Marvin is coming because he was a part of the Baptist church. <laughs> but I don't know about the Baptist church, but in the Pentecostal church, they did th this way. They said, here's the basket. Everybody has an offering, bring an offering. And the preacher would give somebody an option to get out of it. He would say, if you don't have no money, just come and touch the basket. And I was there. I remember getting up because I was broke. Getting up. Oh, God. And I would do it expecting a return. Let's think of the logic of it. I was doing it to expect. And I know some of y'all fighting me right now in the spirit. I can hear you. But it was your faith, Reverend. I'm going to fight back with you. Because faith without works. So we would touch the basket, expecting. And the truth of the matter is, we didn't get. Because you, you can't get what you don't. You can't get a harvest without planting a seed. So the days of touching it is over. I'm bringing somebody to an ending of something and a beginning of something new. You gotta have a seed. Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse so there may be meat in my house. Prove me with that and see if I'll not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you won't have room enough to receive. You ain't gonna get no blessing that you ain't got room enough to receive just because you come to church. And I stand up here and I decree and declare in the name of Jesus that all of you, everyone under the sound of my voice, I speak prophetically to you that you will increase this year like never before, that bonuses will come, checks will come, unexpected checks in the mail. You know, I get really deep into that thing. Unexpected checks in the mail will come to you. And you'll know what y'all do. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Well, those days are over. Because it's not going to happen for you just because I say it. I can confess stuff over you all day and all night, but if you don't apply your life to what is being given to you by truth, by the word of God, if you don't work, how about this? If you don't work with it, it will not work to you. Or I should say will not come to you. You got to work, you got to. I see you. Contingency. You got to plant a seed to get a harvest. Don't nobody love me because you ain't planting no love seeds. See, you got to understand me because, you know, I don't have a lot of friends like everybody else because people don't understand how I am. You mean. That's how you is. You hard to get along with. That's why people don't want to be around you. Breath stink probably and everything. But a mess. You're a mess. Come on, people don't understand who I am. Nah. He that wants friends must first show himself what? It's, you can't have no friends if you don't understand the contingency with that. You got to be friendly. You got to be nice. I'm off track right now. Let me get back. I'm done with telling y'all, making all these promises to you about, about the great miracles that you're going to get and you don't want to obey God's word. I done went right to my point. I went right, right to my point. Some things in you that you have grown up with, you got to let it die. There'll be no butterfly without the death of a caterpillar. Some things have got to die. Some old traditions and things that used to do it back in the day has got to die so God can bring you to a new level and show you some fresh new ways that you can function from what he promised. Going a little bit ahead of myself, but I'm coming. That's in the natural. In the physical realm, there is also contingencies. They say, and I wrote this down, if you heat water past 220 degrees Fahrenheit, you will get steam. You don't get the steam until you boil the water. Are y'all with me? 
I know this is so elementary, but you don't get the steam just because you put the water in the pan and then you say, I command a miracle. <laughs> now, you got to turn the fire up. The steam is not going to come. It's contingent upon you heating it up. Am I talking to somebody today, Jesus? <sighs> That's the physical. I, I, I got others, but I ain't got time. Let me go right to the spiritual realm. Here's how the spiritual realm operates. God has also given us contingencies by way of his spirit to cause him to do what he does. And, and we got to align ourselves. He, here's something that's important. If you want the Holy Ghost, receiving the Holy Ghost is contingent upon you repenting. He ain't going to just feel you because you don't come to this altar and people are praying, laying hands on you. And even if you fall on the floor, you still got to get up and repent. Because the Holy Ghost is a gift. But here's something that we have not been taught. It is a gift to those who have repented and now pre presented yourself to God to receive the gift. I know you thought the Holy Ghost just coming out of nowhere and going to come on anything and anybody and everything. There's a contingency here. <laughs> I think about what we desire when we come to church. We want God to work a miracle. But your miracle is contingent upon the attitude that you have and the way you come into the house of God. I want the blessings of the Lord. Pastor, could you pray that the Lord would bless me today? Pastor, would you lay hands on me and pray that the Lord would bless me on my job? No. <laughs> I'm not going to do it anymore. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you, have you been coming to, to work on time? Because if you want me to pray that you get blessed on your job, I need to know if you're coming to work on time because I can pray the blessings... But the blessing is contingent upon your obedience. They told your, I said, yo. Mm. They told your backside to be there at 8 o'clock. You can't keep coming in here at 8.15, 8.20 with coffee and a donut in your hand. And then come to church, I'm like, you know, preacher, pastor, you need to pray. They won't give me a raise, but I believe that devil's a liar. No, you the liar. <laughs> devil ain't got nothing to do with that one right there. You're supposed to be faithful in whatever you do because the, there are contingencies to your... Right. And, and I'm, I don't know about y'all, but I ain't mad at the church people. I ain't mad at y'all. But I'm really, you're working me to death. You making me pray, you making me call, you making me say stuff, and you don't want to rise to the level of your responsibility. You, you don't want to obey the truth. You don't want to obey the laws of the land. You, don't, you keep breaking the laws of the land, and then you want me to come to court and get you out. Nah, you need to go to jail. No. <laughs> oh, God, help me today. Help me, Jesus. Blessings are contingent upon your obedience. Yeah. Write that down. You need to take that home with you. Blessings are contingent upon your obedience. Blessings <laughs> requires obedience. Good God, help me today. Everything God is, everything God, everything God is Everything, every blessing of God is contingent upon our obedience. We don't teach this enough in church, but I come to let somebody know that. Every blessing of God is contingent upon your obedience. It's upon your obedience, bless you, son. It's upon your obedience, he said. It's contingent upon your obedience. It's not how, oh God, help me, Jesus. You're going, I know you're going to judge me on this. It's not how long you pray. It's not even how long you fast. You can fast and pray all day, all night, 40 days, 40 nights. But until you are obedient to the voice of God, all that fasting you should have ate. 
You should have you should have went to bed and got some sleep. What would it mean for you to be so spiritual, but you don't obey God? This is new, this is next level, y'all. Uh, uh. Abel's sacrifice, listen to this. Abel's sacrifice could have been accepted if he had the right attitude. The Bible says in Genesis 4 and 7, if thou doest well, if thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? I'm, I'm amazed at God's conversation with this guy. He said, boy, all you had to do was, was right. All you had to do was have it right in your head. Because if you had it right in your head, you would have did what's right, and you would not have judged your brother's sacrifice as something that was greater than your sacrifice. You had the wrong perception. You had the wrong understanding. You had the wrong mindset. Good God, help me today. You think God is a respecter of persons? No, he's not. But he is a respecter of those who don't have the right consciousness in their minds and in their hearts to do what is right by him. He, does not, he doesn't have to take your sacrifice because you bring it to him. You got to bring it to him the right way. Oh, God, help me today, Jesus. I think about the children of Israel. They would have been spared the disease that came upon them if, somebody say if. Here's, here's your word that you take today. The word, it's the smallest word in the Bible, but it's the most powerful word. And that word is if, I-F. The children of Israel would be spared the disease God put upon the Egyptians if, somebody say if. if. Can, can I read it to you real quick? Because I got it down here. Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, and saith, and saith, if thou wilt diligently hearken. Listen to this, y'all. If you will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God, the voice of God. If you will diligently hearken to the voice of God. If you would not just hear him today and not hear him tomorrow, but if you will be diligent in your hearing. If you will be consistent in your healing. In your hearing, I'm sorry. If you will be consistent in your hearing. Here's what he says. If you'll be diligent, hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and will do that which is right in his sight. You got to do what's right in his sight. I'm telling you, one of the things that's crippling the church is that all we have is people doing stuff for the sake of people. And I'm looking for somebody that will do what you do for the sake of the kingdom of God. When are we going to do what we do because it reflects God and not ourselves? Help me, help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. He says, what you got to do is diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and will do that which is right in his sight and will give, oh, I'm sorry, when are we going to start doing stuff that's right in the sight of God, even if it's against what you want to do and what you feel? We got it. Next level is doing things that are right in the sight of God. God, what do you say about God? Did I obey you with this? Or did I obey my feelings in this? He says, you got to diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight and will give ear to his commandments. Here, he is, here it is also. He says, you got to give ear to his commandments. You, you got to do what he says to do. You got to act out what he has already put his word inside of you to do. Say this, I got to act out what his word has already been said to me. You got to act out what his word has already been planted in. His, his word is a seed in you, and you got to start acting it out. I've discovered that the majority of people in the church who have found themselves in a very awkward position whereby you should be demonstrating things that represent God and not yourself, but because you can't seem to distinguish the things that you need to do that will give glory and honor to God and really heap coals of fire upon your enemies. That was something fresh. Because you can't figure that out. You, you don't understand why you're not going to the next level. Your next level is contingent upon your obedience. Oh God, help me. He said, keep all his statutes. You can't just take the ones you like, the ones that are comfortable to you, and throw away the rest. You got to keep his statutes. His, you got, his statutes are everything that he values. Good God, help me today. 
He says, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your God that healeth thee. It was important that the people of God, Israel, that the children of, 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 of God knew the contingency on their healing, on their miracle, on their deliverance. He said, this is what you got to do. And if you don't do this, you won't reap that. Here's, here we are. We as a people of God. How many believe you're a people of God? You're, the Bible calls us a peculiar treasure of God. Let me bust your bubble. You can only be a peculiar treasure of God if. Let me give it to you. Exodus chapter 19, verse 5. Now therefore, if... If, if, I'm mad that it's written in small cap. It's not capitalized. If ye will obey my voice, indeed, and keep my, com can y'all find that with me? Exodus chapter 19, verse 5. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice, indeed, and keep my covenant, keep my covenant, then ye shall be, you're not going to be a, a peculiar treasure until you do what you're supposed to do by keeping his commandments. You got to do your part. Just can't float up in here saying I'm riding on somebody else's faith. Nah, you got to get yourself together. You got to position yourself where you can hear his voice and not stop there. Because the, the healing and deliverance, the thing that brings you to your breakthrough is your obedience to his voice. I almost want to stop right here and ask God to touch every ear in this house. I'm not saying this to belittle or make it a joke. But one of my precious daughters in the Lord has a, she has a, a child and uh, the child cannot hear clearly. Can, it's a very small window of hearing. And, and the other day I was calling her name out and, 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 and the, the auntie looked at me and she said, she can't hear you. She can't hear you. I said, what? She said, no, she cannot hear you. That's why she has not responded to you. Because I was trying to figure out, I'm calling her name and she's not, turn, she's not looking, she's not turning around, she's not, she's not responding. And I thought about you church people. You around here, you're not responding to God because you can't act like you can't hear God. God's, God's giving you truth through his word. You come in here every Thursday night. You come in here on Sunday mornings. Well, some of you come in here every, every other Sunday morning. Well, some of you come once a month. Well, you come in here. And God, I believe, speaks to you. And you walk out of here like you, don't, like you didn't hear him say anything. Because you're not responding. You're not responding. You can't, I say, this, I say this a lot. You can't. Come in here, get God, and leave the same way you came in. I need you to push your neighbor and say, no, it's not done that way. It's not done that way. It's not, as a matter of fact, tell your neighbor, it's not supposed to work that way. When you come and hear God, you hear the truth. It's the truth that you know that sets you free. And to hear God is to obey God. Because when you obey him, that's when you're going to reap. So, so we're trying to be a peculiar treasure unto the Lord. No, you ain't no peculiar treasure because you got a good dance and then you're not a peculiar treasure because you got a good song you want to sing. I usher on the usher, but I don't care about none of that. I need to find some ushers that will obey God. I need to find some worship people that will obey God. I don't care how good you can sing. I don't care how good you can play. I think that's wonderful. But you better get to the place where you can obey God because the only way that all of us are going to receive from God is when all of us begin to obey God. The, the way that the body of Christ grows and is edified and is strengthened is when you and I are our brother's keeper. So we got to hold each other in account. We got to ask each other, where are you in God? I don't care about your gift right now. Where are you in obeying God? I don't care how much ability you got. Where are you in? That's what, that's what we are. I want to sign in the church. Where are you in obeying God? Because that's next level. All the singing, all the dancing, all the shouting, all the speaking in tongues. You know how to do that. Do you learn, have you learned how to obey God? Have you learned how to keep his commandments? I'm sorry, I'm not mad at y'all. 
No, it looks like I'm mad at y'all. I ain't mad at y'all. I just want you to get to this next level. Because if I, don't, if I don't teach this to you, you'll not know what the next level looks like. I'm trying to give you a picture of what the next level looks like. Your next level is contingent upon your obedience to God. You're not going to get there if you're not willing to obey him. If you're not willing to keep his statutes, keep his commandments, if you're not willing to do that, that means you're not willing to grow. You're not willing to let, get to the next level. Y'all sitting really quiet and really still. I know my time is up. I am, <laughs> you're listening to me. I am determined to not just motivate you. Because see, motivation can get you excited about the possibilities of what you can do. I don't want to just motivate you. I want to send a sense of inspiration. Inspiration goes inside of you and pulls up. You don't want to just be motivated because you keep getting motivated, keep getting motivated, and... Sunday, next Sunday, praise him. I want you to get inspired so much so that when you come in here, I reach down within the city of your existence and I pull up your gift, your calling, your anointing. I pull up your possibilities so that you're not just motivated, but you're inspired to keep it going. I, I got what I need and I see what I, what I need to see so that I'll not let anything detract me or dis disrupt where I'm getting ready to go. I'm trying to get to the next level and I don't, need to be, I don't need to be like I was last year, you know, up the day, down tomorrow, in and out. I was, I was mammy pammy. I was like a jellyfish. Didn't have really backbone. But I come today to stand. I come to be secured in my centeredness with God and my centeredness, my centeredness with God produces within me the power to obey him regardless of what it looks like. He, he wants your obedience more than he wants, oh God, your sacrifice. We bring a sacrifice absent of obedience. And God is saying to the church now, I ain't accepting that. No, we've been here before. That's not enough. I, I need you to look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, that's not enough. I'm putting an end. I'm putting the end today. Oh my God. You see, we want God to fight for us. We want God to destroy our enemies, don't we? God will be on your side if. Exodus chapter 23. I'm going to give you two more and I'll be done. Exodus chapter 23, verse 22. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice, this is the key, contingent. This is the contingency. You obey his voice and do all that I speak, not just what you want to do, what makes you comfortable, but do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies. You want God to fight for you? Obey him. You want him to knock your enemies out? Prove them wrong? It's through your obedience. Last thing I'm going to do, I'm going to share with you this morning, this afternoon. All y'all that talking about, man, I'm telling you, I heard the preacher preach today, God's going to bless me. I don't know about that. Because here's what I've learned. In Deuteronomy chapter number 11, verse 26, 27, 28, Behold, I set before you, oh, 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 watch this. I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. God always sets before us, and every time we gather, I believe, a blessing and a curse. A blessing and a curse. He says, a blessing if, the blessing is contingent upon these words. If ye obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, today. He says, the blessing is only going to come if you do this. And if you do not do that, he says, and a curse, if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way, which I command you this day to go after other gods, which ye have not known. He says, if you do this, if you turn away from God... He says, now this is the thing that really, really helped me understand this whole process here. He says, I, I, I lay before you, are you with me? This is the last point. He says, I lay before you blessings. Uh, here's your blessings. Uh, here's your curses. 
No, he says, the blessing and the curse. The blessing is here. I'm tired. I ain't running right now. The blessing is here. The curse is here. He says, I lay it before you. And most of us, when we read that, that text, we conclude that all I have to do to get the blessing is to choose the blessing. Oh, the blessing, curse. What do I want to do? Blessing, curse. You know what? This is a no-brainer. I want to be blessed. And so when we get to grow up in church, they teach us, choose the blessing. And we conclude that if I choose the blessing, Daniel, if I choose the blessing, I'm going to be blessed. But that's not what the text says. He says, I lay you, I lay before you to choose blessing, curse. If you choose to be blessed, the contingency is that you got to obey my voice. What does that mean? That means you can choose blessing but not be blessed. Is that good? I'm loving your beard, man. I'm trying to get my beard. You can choose. He says, because I lay it before you, choose. Choose. Okay, no brainer. I choose to be blessed. You can choose the blessing, but still not be blessed. Come on, y'all been in church long enough to ask the question, I believe God, but why am I not receiving it? You got to conclude that there's something else connected to it. He says, if you are obedient, only then can you receive, the, eat the fat of the lamb. He says, you can, you can know that the blessing is over here, but unless I come under the obedience of it, it can be there and not work for you. What? Because then we say, when we don't get it, the manifestation of it, we either blame God or blame the people around us. We never consider that the, there's a possibility that maybe I didn't obey God and of course I couldn't obey him if I didn't figure out his voice. If you never, I'm sorry y'all, I'm sorry. I'm saying I'm sorry but I'm really not. I'm just enjoying this. If you never spend the time to be aware of his voice you'll never be able to obey I'm sorry I'm screaming let's put this thing in this proper order if you wrestle and been wrestling with whether or not that's his voice Here's what you need to do. You've been praying, you've been fasting. Lord, I want to see you move. Lord, I want you to pour your spirit. God, you, I'm fast. we're fasting and praying for the, for the glory of the Lord to fill the temple. How about you fast and pray to hear his voice? Stop, stop, stop. Now this ain't going to sit right with a lot of people. Stop fasting and praying for everybody else. Take some time for you. Because if you don't hear him, there's no way you obey him so we got to go back to the to the core we got to go back to the center we got to we got to hear him daughter we got to i need to hear lord you said your sheep know your voice and a stranger will not follow and we're tired of being i'm tired of i'm tired of holy ghost filled tongue talking church hopping spinning like a top ticking like a clock people that don't know his voice. I don't even know, and I'm going to stop. I promise you I'm going to stop, babe. I know you want me to stop. I don't know how people can come to church after so many times in church and be okay with not hearing God. I don't understand that, Mike. I'm t I don't understand that. Because if we say that we are his, we belong to him. He our daddy. Hmm. I wish my son would come up in here acting like he ain't never heard nothing I said. What? I don't 
that kind of relationship. Next level. Next level is for you and I to create a relationship with him. Let's, can I end on that? Let's work toward creating a relationship with him because there ain't going to be no next level if, if you don't get this foundation right. He said, my sheep know my voice. You got to know his voice. And, and there's so many ways. Okay, my time is up. Uh, there's so many ways of hearing his voice. Maybe next week we can, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe, somebody asked me at the end of the 8 o'clock service. They said, you're going to make this a series? I think I will. Maybe I will. Because that's, that's vitally important because hearing his voice is the thing that is contingent upon your miracle. And I know you've been in church and you say, well, I'm just believing God when I come. It's just going to happen. In the kingdom of God, things don't just happen from you. Things do happen from him. But he gives us the responsibility to condition ourselves so that we understand the contingency that is attached to him. This is how you get me to work. Oh, I'm helping somebody I know. This is how you get God to work. He's not your puppet on the street. But he is your daddy. And based on your relationship with him, creates avenues and ways, means that he can get to you what you need. And it's not always first the physical thing, but it will be always first his word thing. Because his word cannot return void. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but not one word that God speaks. Close your eyes, bow your heads, let's pray. Father, would you anoint our ears today as we take this journey toward the next level. Lord, I thank you for the contingencies that are connected to our next level. We can't get to where we want to go to without hearing from you. We can't, we can't know that we have our battles being fought by you if we don't know you if we have not experienced you. So Lord, today, today, from the front of the church to the back of the church, oh, oh God, it's not just the fact that we've been coming to church, coming to church. So what? Lord, give us to hear you. Incline our ears. Anoint our ears. Not the natural ears, but the spiritual ears so that we can embrace the fullness of your blessings upon us that has a contingency plan connected to us. Oh God, we thank you in advance. And we take the challenge of if, if we obey your commandments, if we walk up right before you, if we choose you over every other God, if, if we hear your voice and harden not our, if we who have been called by your name will humble ourselves, if my people, we take the challenge of the biggest the smallest, the most powerful, yet the smallest word, if. We want to get to where we want to get to faster and further and faster. So Lord, help us not to throw away what's necessary so we can go your way. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.